All right, hello and welcome to Investing Amid 2020's Unprecedented Market Volatility, an event that's powered by CNBC Pro, which is CNBC's premium subscription-based service. Today, we are giving some of our Delivering Alpha attendees a flavor of what it's like to be a pro subscriber and a pro member who have access to exclusive live stream content, some coverage from around the world, content from around the world, exclusive articles, also our monthly live pro talks as well, a preview of which you're kind of seeing right here at Delivering Alpha. These are subscriber-only events and discussions designed to really provide access to CNBC talent, the reporters that we have here, uh, many of the guests that we have, in, in the hopes that we can provide some actionable takeaways and in-depth insights for some of our viewers and listeners and subscribers. I'm Dominic Chu. I am CNBC's senior markets correspondent. I'm joined today by on air stocks editor Bob Pisani, who you're seeing right there on your screen as well. Also, our senior markets commentator Michael Santoli, who's on your screen there. The three of us will be here kind of joining with you guys today to go through this process. Now, a big part of giving our subscribers this opportunity is to actually submit questions that they have on their own, and then we'll try to answer them. So they've been curated specifically for all of these particular members that we have and specifically for our delivering alpha attendees today so with all of that in mind what i'd like to do right now is kind of get into it here with some of the questions that we have that we've kind of curated from our audience right now and i guess i'll start first of all with just an open one here and we'll kind of toss it out to either bob or mike and we'll kind of add into the discussion uh let's talk a little bit about some of the market predictions that we've seen one of the questions that we have is that it seems that all market predictions must stop at the point when phase three vaccine trial data is announced. That is a huge inflection point that can send markets way up or way down. What exactly are your thoughts about just how important a vaccine is to the overall market narrative? And maybe Bob Bissani, I will start with you on this first. How important is that vaccine? It's the most important thing in the market right now, but it's not the end of history. So remember, I tend to think in terms of buckets of what moves the market. So the positive news on the vaccine moves the markets. Positive news on treatment moves the markets because that affects the other buckets, the reopening story and how is that doing and the stimulus story. That's a third bucket. So all of that's tied together, but it's not the end of history. Once that happens, we have other things to deal with as well. So, for example, China uh, trade tensions. That's very real. That will likely not go away even if we do get some kind of vaccine very quickly. The other major issue we have to deal with is the valuation qu question. We're having a very hard time figuring out the real value, particularly of technology stocks. Uh, maybe the, a vaccine would help settle that a little bit, but it's still a very big and open debate. And finally, the important thing out there is the whole Tina thing. I, I you know, There is no alternative. Tina is a bit of a cliche. It's been around for a few years, but it's a very real phenomenon. You can't get a return on bonds at all, and that's forcing people into the stock market. The Fed is as well. So yes, I would say a vaccine would be the most important development for the markets near term, but it doesn't eliminate all the issues the market has to deal with. Now, Mike, it's, it's kind of interesting when we talk about the vaccine, we, we focus so much on that that kind of slate of companies, whether it's the the Gileads, the Regenerons, the Modernas, the the, the, the mega cap, the Pfizer's, Merck types of the world and whatnot, everyone who's trying to work towards these particular either vaccines or treatments, how much do we think that the market has already kind of expected or priced in the positivity around either a treatment for existing COVID conditions and or a vaccine to help prevent? Yeah, to a significant degree, Dom. In fact, I would say that uh, the idea that we are within several months, however you want to really parse it, of uh, a vaccine breakthrough is a premise and one of the reasons the market is uh, as high as it is. So I, I do think that you have to think about these things not as a moment in time that's going to be like a light switch pre-vaccine, post-vaccine, and the market is in one phase before it and one phase after it. It actually is a process of the market incrementally every day trying to digest the information and discount what that's going to mean down the road. You can actually think about it too in terms of when we were expecting a tax cut bill back in 2017, the market would respond to every incremental piece of news and price in the potential benefits of the corporate tax cut along the way. And guess what? 
Once we once it was passed in December of 2017, a month later, we had a very big correction because a lot of the great effects were priced in. Something roughly similar happened with the China uh, trade negotiations, where it would seem as if we kind of sell off on tariff news if it got worse and we would improve if it seemed like a deal was happening. And then we did actually get uh, the, the makings of some kind of a deal. And that was also not too far before the market uh, had a big pullback. So I, I would I would hesitate to to say that that's going to be the all clear moment uh, when we do get a vaccine, because the market may already have figured a lot of that out by that point. Not to say it's going to be a sell the news event, although some would say that. Uh, but I think you have to think about it more dynamically and perhaps in terms of what types of stocks might be more or less in favor under a vaccine uh, economy, so to speak, than those that are uh, in favor right I'm, now. I'm Bob, I, I, I look back and and I think to myself of all of the health scares that we've seen and the way that kind of markets have reacted to them. I, I, I hearken back to what happened with the Ebola, right? I, I, I hearken back to what happened with SARS and MERS and, and, and some of the other issues that we've seen, the, you know, the, uh, some of the Asian-based kind of influenzas that we saw back in like the late 90s. I mean, is there any anything that we can remember over the course of the last maybe two or three decades that even comes close to what we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic? No, this is pretty remarkable. I mean, think about what's happened. If a year ago, I would have said to you, you know, there's going to be a global pandemic that is going to shut down the economies around the world. You would have laughed at me. It literally is a science fiction story. Uh, you know, it's the Andromeda strain and things like that. Uh, so. This was one of those strange black swan events that just came virtually out of nowhere. Uh, they don't happen too often. Let's hope they don't happen very often uh, in the future. But if you look at how well we have dealt with this, I'm I'm really very impressed. I was very concerned in March and April. I'm less concerned now that there will be really, really long term damage. I'm concerned, obviously, about the impact on small businesses and what's going on uh, with that. I think we're going to see a large amount of small businesses uh, go out of business. But hopefully, over and it will be over, I do think there is an end to this. Um, we can find new ways to help those people get back. So I'm more optimistic and more impressed with the resiliency of U.S. technology and even U.S. small businesses. I, I look at the way the restaurants have, have set up for the winter coming. Uh, I see restaurants out, out here that are we're going to be in in uh, with heat lamps uh, into Thanksgiving, standing outside, um, uh, having having our dinner. So the resiliency of the American entrepreneur is really quite remarkable to me. Don. I mean, a, a great news peg too, because today is the day that indoor dining reopens in New York City and whatnot. So we're going to see kind of like a little bit of an experiment in a very very large, the biggest metro area in America, and how we can kind of gradually get things going again. So. Obviously, for all those restaurant restaurant owners out there, we're, we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed for you. You brought up the technology aspect, uh, Bob. So I'm going to turn now to this next question from a viewer, a listener, a pro subscriber. And Mike, we'll begin with you on this one here. The technology stocks and, and the stay-at-home ones in particular have been a huge focus for a lot of the investors out there given the pandemic. How widely do you see tech stocks diverging from traditional S&P 500 incumbents during the rest of the COVID pandemic and beyond. Now, the COVID stocks aren't necessarily all S&P 500, not names like Zoom or Peloton or others, but technology has been a key even before the pandemic. It's even more so now. It's just not Facebook, Alphabet, and Amazon, and you know Al Apple, right? Sure. Right, uh, Shopify, you could name another one that's not in the S&P 500. It, it, very difficult to, to say with any precision exactly how much they might diverge. I do think you could look toward August and the extremes that were reached in August in terms of, let's say, the NASDAQ 100 and how far it had raced ahead of the rest of the market and raced ahead of the average stock out there, the equal weighted you know, measure of uh, what stocks are doing in the market. And you could say that is that's a pretty uh, maybe unstable extreme. Now, we've come back off of that. Um, and one thing I would also point out that, yes, you had a handful of very, very large stocks that accounted for a great deal of the overall market cap that was added uh, during the March to August and September rally. But it's not to say that the entire market was not also up without them. So it was just a matter of magnitude and velocity more than it was these five stocks up and the rest of the market down. Um, so I do think some of that's been rectified to some degree. Also, it's not strictly the shutdown dynamics that has had a lot of money flowing into those names. What happened also during this period is 
the growth rates for earnings for most companies basically became completely you know, into, in a fog. Uh, a lot of them were having massive hits to revenue. A lot of them had big balance sheet problems. And those companies were also the same ones that had a perception of perceived long-term stable profit growth. And it was a massive premium placed on them. So arguably, if in fact we do get a broader corporate profit uh, pickup as people are projecting out into next year and the year after, then the premium on the scarcity of the growth of those handful of very large names with long-term growth outlooks uh, could come back a, a little bit. Yeah, Bob, I, th I, I was just going to say, are there, are, there, are there things, are there parts of the market within that tech sector? I mean, we, we talk so much about cloud computing and software in general. Those seem to be real standouts yeah. in that kind of a technology type regime as well. I watch ETFs very carefully. I got a show, ETF Edge, uh, which you should tune into, ETF Edge. That's CNBC.com. There's the promo. Um, and what I see every day is the sectors that get the most volume are what we call thematic ETFs and, and tech thematic ETFs, the robotics ETF, the lithium and battery uh, ETF, the disruptive technology ETF. So the answer is all of these are being used by corporations to one extent or another, software as a service ETFs, uh, to make their operations and their businesses more efficient, even robotics ETFs, for example. Uh, and yes, so the bigger question is a broader question, which is uh, technology has outperformed this decade. Will that continue? There are people who argue this time it's different. Whenever you hear that, you check your wallet because generally it's not. So if you look out at the stock market, the question is very simple. Is the future going to look like the past? If it's not, then the stock market exhibits mean reversion. Things tend to smooth out over time. The market leaders of 20 years ago are not the market leaders of today. Look at General Electric or look at Exxon, any of those. So if that is true, that the future looks like the past in the stock market, we should start to see outperformance in other groups. So, for example, growth versus value. It's not so much value is underperformed. It's growth has been perversely outperforming this decade for the reasons we had talked about. Theoretically, there should be some mean reversion on that. Certainly Warren Buffett's betting on that, but that's true of everything. Small cap, they did better in the 2000s. Theoretically, there should be some mean reversion uh, there. Uh, large versus small and the same situation. So the question is, how long as an investor do you want to hang on to that? Do you want to cling to tech stocks and assume that the future is going to be exactly like the past? go ahead, but I would suggest longer term, and this is over many years, mean reversion probably has not gone away. All right. A really quick follow up here for, for you, Mike. I mean, the, the thematic ETFs and those kinds of trends are things that Bob follows all the time. Are, are, are there any particular uh, signs or triggers or, or kind of, you know, posts out there that you can look at to say, hey, maybe this is showing us that there could be a possible regime change, that maybe value stocks catch a bid, or that you know the, the financial sector finally goes kind of forward. It, there's got to be something out there that you're looking towards, and, and history tells us, is a way that maybe indicates perhaps the initial parts of a change in trend or a change in sentiment. Yeah, the character of the market suddenly has even changed already. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it really goes down along the lines of growth versus value as we traditionally define value, uh, because value, at, you know, the way Wall Street has categorized it, it takes you right to financials and energy and also a lot of challenged business models and things like chain retail. Uh, those are very, very cheap looking stocks statistically. And that's what value gets you. I would say, though, that cyclical companies that are geared toward an economic revival are the ones that have begun to outperform. So if you wanted to look at industrials, within industrials, transportation stocks, they've actually gotten real traction. Semiconductor stocks are almost a kind of souped up version of the old industrials and transports. They've been outperforming a new relative high just this week. So I think that's telling you the market is seeing its way past this idea that it's only the big secular growth uh, companies, the defensive growth companies that are gonna be working from now on. Also. Equal weighted consumer discretionary. I know this is a, there is an ETF for that, RCD, by the way. It, it essentially gives you consumer discretionary without the outsized impact of Amazon, which is dominant in that sector. And it also has uh, actually begun to outperform a little bit. A lot of that is housing related stocks. So I think along those 
vectors, you can see the market saying that there is something coming after. I just would, and maybe in fact, we're going to get a, a pendulum swing back to, you know, true pure value type strategies. But I think that's not something the market has yet been uh, been implying. By so there's been a, there's been an interesting discussion about the, the, the driving forces behind the recent market action. And that gets us to our next uh, pro subscriber, pro member question. How big of a factor are the quote unquote Robin Hoods of the world uh, on the market action so far? And how much does all of this inexperienced retail demand worry you, Bob Pisani? When we say Robin Hoods, you know, I, I want to try to explain it. We're talking about like retail traders, those people who are trading on platforms like Robin Hood, even though we know pretty much every retail brokerage platform is commission free these days. But but is it is it a surge in quote unquote inexperienced traders that's driving a lot of the action? Why Zoom and why Fastly and some of these other names are so ridiculously high in terms of valuation? Yeah. So traditionally, you know, 40, 50 years ago, 80 percent of the market on a typical day of trading was retail investors trading with each other. That's gone away largely. So th the numbers are fuzzy and they're hard to get at, but a working rule I've been using for the last couple of years is about 15% of the market is retail. The rest are professional traders. It's gotten more efficient and much more difficult for retail traders to trade. I think there has been some increase in retail. Maybe it's gone to 20%, largely because of Robinhood, largely because people are staying at home and have time on their hands to trade. Um, I'm happy that more people are involved in trading in the market. I'm not so sure that active retail trading, particularly day trading, is the right way to get into the market. Um, there is a reason they're called dumb money. I find that phrase very offensive because generally it's our viewers they're talking about. I find it offensive, but I'm not sure it's inaccurate. There is a reason Wall Street is very eager to have the trade trading flow from Robinhood because they like to trade against it and they think they can make money on it. So retail, active retail traders, if you look at the academic research, they tend to exhibit what's called, the academics call it perverse stock selection. It's a weird word, but basically instead of buying low, selling high, you buy high and sell low. They don't tend to make money over any kind of reasonably long-term period. So uh, that's why I love having more people in, but I like long-term buy and hold, you know, Jack Bogle, Vanguard type investing. But that's harder to do when you have an app. Think about this, you know, 20 years ago, Dom, when you first had these online brokerage firms that were out there that you could get it on your own laptop, you had to add the orders in. It took a long time and you got a confirmation anywhere from 20 minutes to the next day for some of these. Today, you're sitting in a, in a bar with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you get a sub-second confirmation. That's a very different methodology methodology of trading. It's it's more like sports gambling to a certain extent. And that's really what goes off in your head, you know, in terms of the behavioral economics. That's the thing that kind of worries me uh, a little bit. So, yeah, great. Love seeing more people involved in the market. Not sure day trading is the way for them to go long term. My, my, Mike, that, that brings up a great point here. I, I mean, there, there are professional money managers out there for a reason. You pay them X percent basis points for a mutual fund manager or an ETF manager to just do all this stuff for you. Do we feel as though maybe this is a pendulum that swung too far? Maybe it is the retail traders out there that are doing this that may be better served by just saying, hey, let me park it with, say, a, a large value manager and, and pay them like 60 basis points a year to help to, to do this for me. Arguably, yes, that that is what, you know, every bit of academic research would tell you the, the short term trading game is essentially zero sum minus the cost that you pay. And there are costs, even if it's zero commission, you that you pay to the facilitators of that trading. So in aggregate, people lose money on it. But I will say that it's not unusual for people to have that to be their entry point into investing. Um, I just saw some numbers today that the that the daily volume flows uh, are closer, I think, to 23 percent, Bob, to in terms of all the discount brokers as the source of that flow. So you're about right up from about 15 percent earlier this year. It does show you this other dominant strain of flow into the market. And, you know, it is very true that the professionals want to interact with that order flow because it not only is it necessarily uninformed, but it's there's a way you can actually play against it because it's easier to model. It's a hurting effect. Uh, there's a more of an emotional character to it. There's more of a buy what's moving already uh, type of mode. And there's also a buy the companies that we're already rooting for. That's a very different 
you know, way of going about this game versus what has been dominant, I think, over the last five to 10 years as Wall Street has become completely electronified and has gone to quant models and has gone to these kind of algorithms where kind of everybody agrees on the signals and and exactly how we're going to trade uh, certain certain um, trigger points uh, and things like that. And it was kind of the machines talking to one another. Well, this is a new idiosyncratic source uh, of flow. And I don't think it's necessarily all good or all bad. It's kind of dangerous if you're using more than play money probably to do it. Uh, and most of it's been happening in a market with the best six month rally in history uh, since March. So, you know, you haven't seen all kinds of environments there, but I don't think it's incompatible with the idea of my retirement money is in the 401k and a target date fund or an index fund. And on the side, you know, for no real outright out of pocket cost, I'm, I'm flipping, you know, fractional shares of Apple or whatever else you're doing, uh, you know, over there. One quick other point is, and I was saying this at the time, as soon as the Robinhood phenomenon really started to take off in the spring and everyone looked at how their app makes it seem like a video game and it was exactly the same kinds of technology cues you get from playing a game. Everybody on Wall Street immediately did the, aha, it's 1999 all over again and this is gonna end in tears. And I actually think people took it as such a danger sign that it created its own wall of worry among professionals. And they immediately started to say, this can't be good if all the amateurs are playing this game. Well, guess what? 1999 was the culmination of years of people getting into the market. And it was really a huge crescendo uh, of buildup that had happened in that tech boom. It didn't happen over the course of a few months. So even if we're headed there, and I'm not sure we are, we aren't right. there. So, so, there's an easy yeah. way to do deal with this. If, and I tell this to young traders all the time. They ask you, if you, if you really feel like, oh, I want to be a day trader, go ahead, but play with a very small amount of your money. T take 10% of it. If you've got $1,000, take $100 and go day trade with it. But the rest, you should be investing longer term in low cost, generally index funds. If you can find a good active manager, go right ahead and knock yourself out. But don't go spending your money day trading on any regular basis. If you want to, use 10 percent and you, experts will tell you that all the time that's very good advice all right so i'm gonna try to get through a couple more questions here before our time runs out we've got a real-time question coming in on that chat line on the corner of your screen there from a pro herself we know her she's shannon sakosha she says she asks has the opportunity for small cap stocks to outperform permanently changed as companies stay private longer and therefore enter the public market at much higher market caps like volunteer today right should investors just focus on acquisition candidates in terms of the sub $15 billion market cap realm? It used to be that you played them, right? You buy mid caps, you buy small caps that turn into mid caps, mid caps that turn into large caps. But because of this phenomenon with IPO markets and everything else, unicorns stay longer until they're like $20, $30 billion in value, and then they IPO. Mike. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. I would just say um, there is some risk that, in fact, small caps now represent kind of, you know, the JV that can't ever make the varsity. Uh, but I do think there are other factors that are at work in terms of the persistence of small cap underperformance. We seem to have right now a winner take most economy in a lot of industries. And we've never seen a company the size of Alphabet compound revenues and earnings at 20% a year, the way it has done in recent years. It just barely fought, fell below 20%. And so trillion and a half dollar companies growing that fast never happened before. And it says something about the character of the economy, I believe. There's also in small cap, a, a sector effect. There is probably too much financials, not enough tech and industrials. Uh, there's a lot of he healthcare as well, but it's slower growth and it's also unprofitable and it's also more leverage and kind of so a lot of the things that would normally kind of foster a little bit of a run in uh, in small caps relative to large are not really working in its favor. It doesn't mean you, you can't ever have it for certain phases of time. But I do think the fact that private equity owns thousands of companies right now with no intention really of making them public uh, is an issue because there is a selection situation there that does take them hey, out. Hey, Bob, of Bob, this is interesting too here because we got a, another good question to follow up on that. It seems as though there's been a market performance of FANG stocks that's been kind of just unruly. I mean, it's been crazy to the upside for so long. Is this the end of diversification as a strategy for long-term stockholders? And what would, you, what would be your advice with regard to investing in just those really mega cap tech names versus diversifying across broader parts of the market? Again, answer this question. Is the future going to look like the past? If that is true, uh, 
uh, then the answer is diversification is still your best way to go. If you suddenly believe that the world's going to be dominated by five tech stocks, good luck, good luck doing that and good luck picking them, okay? Because they're not going to stay this way forever. We know that for sure. So uh, I would be very careful. I still and maintain, and remember, I'm a Jack Bogle guy. I, I grew up with Vanguard and Bogle and their attitude, and I don't think they've been wrong and look at the assets under management. They've been certainly right, at least investors believe that broadly diversified assets, including S&P 500, small caps, international and bonds, that sounds boring. You can argue where, how you wanna slice and dice it, but long-term that is not proved to be a losing investment. I just wanna comment quickly on of the small caps. The problem we have here is that there's too much cheap money for too long. The problem is simply there is too much capital, too much money chasing too few investments. So when you have a lot of money chasing very few ideas that are out there, even in the tech area, and you have really cheap money, that's a solution to a lot of companies saying, why should I go private? Why bother? public, excuse me, why bother doing that? It's too much trouble. The regulatory issues are a problem. Let's stay private. And they keep giving me money. I keep getting new rounds of funding. That's why private equity and, and venture capital are alternative forms of investments that you have out there. It's why you also have alternative ways to go public like SPACs and direct listings as well. And I'd like to see, I'm, I agree with you, Dom. I, I want to see more small companies go public quicker and not sit private. I think American investors have really lost out on early stage development of a lot of companies. All right, Bob, Mike, we've got the main stage getting ready to get started here for the next Delivering Alpha session. I'm gonna give you a one line, one word, one comment to wrap things up. Michael Santoli, what's the most important part of the market that you're watching for the next six to 12 months? Uh, I would reiterate that it is the, the cyclical parts. You have this unusual situation where you have early cycle recovery type forces, but late cycle valuations in a lot of the big growth stocks. So it's, it's whether the fact that cyclical groups can keep traction, that'll keep you uh, in this mode of saying that we're in a longer term recovery All right, What do you think, phase. Bob? I'm still watching the software stocks. I think Andreessen was right. Software is eating the world. It is now the backbone of virtually everything, even cyclical stocks, essentially run on software. All right. Thanks very much, guys. That's CNBC senior markets commentator, Michael Santoli, also our on-air Sox editor, Bob Bassani, myself, Dominic Chu at CNBC. We all thank you for joining and please get uh, enjoy the rest of Delivering Alpha. I just want to say one more thing before we close out here. A reminder that Delivering Alpha attendees, you can read it in your chat box, can get pro with an exclusive offer of 30% off the first year of an annual subscription by going over to CNBC dot com slash pro at da all in one word use the promo code da30 da30 all right as subscribers you can join us on the first wednesday of every month starting october 7th which is cnbc's brian sullivan and david giro portfolio manager at the capital appreciation fund at t row price thank you very much for joining us folks at delivering alpha learn more about cnbc pro and enjoy the rest of the program we'll see you next time around thank you guys Great job, Dom. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, man. Take care. See you.